good afternoon to everyone i welcome all of you to the 57th lecture in the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics conducted by the department of nonlinear dynamics parvidas university with the support from rusa 2.0 i am happy to introduce today's speaker dr vishal washan from international center for theoretical sciences tafr bengaluru i met dr vishal washan first time in the year 2016 at santini ketan Vishwabharati University, West Bengal. I was there to deliver a lecture in a conference, and Dr. Vishal Vasan has been put up as my roommate in the guest house. He has also been invited to deliver a lecture in the same meeting. As the place university was new and uh, very big to us, we went for long walks a couple of times. During that time, I raised several questions in partial differential equations, and he clarified all my doubts. He told me that he did his school education in Trichy. After that meeting, I used to get in touch with him as he is also working on nonlinear partial differential equations as I do. He had also been visited Maris Dasan University and interacted with the faculty and the students. Dr. Vishal Vasan is basically an engineer. He completed his BE in Anna University, Chennai in the year 2005. and attained his ms in mechanical engineering in the year 2007 from arizona state university united states of america he then moved on to science and did his ms in applied mathematics in the university of washington and completed his phd in applied mathematics from the same university in the year 2012 he was working as a assistant professor in pennsylvania in state university for 3 years he then came back to india and joined as a faculty member in icts ta for bangalore in the year 2005 2015 and continuing his job at various capacities his main interest lie on partial differential equations their applications and methods of constructing solutions both analytical and numerical in particular he works on pdes which come from a variety of applications including water waves both in steam condensates atmospheric science and nonlinear optics with this short introduction now i invite dr vishal washan to deliver his lecture over to you dr vishal thank you thank you, thank, thank you so much for that uh, very kind uh, and uh, uh, sort of very wonderful introduction um, i also sort of remember when we first met in shantiniketan it was a very nice campus and it was nice to nice to meet uh, people In, in that uh, in that in that uh, environment um i also would like to thank everyone uh, who's attending this talk uh thanks for taking the time uh to participate in this uh, lecture series uh this is a very uh, wonderful lecture series that i know i've seen uh that there are more than 50 lectures now and uh, i haven't seen all 50 but those which i have seen i've enjoyed thoroughly and i hope uh my talk today uh will do justice to this uh, very nice lecture series uh that's been going on uh, thanks to uh the department of nonlinear dynamics at bharti dasan um so with that uh, i'd like to begin my talk uh the title is on on the slide um and i would like to say that some of the work that i'm going to present today is joint with uh, my collaborators uh so credit uh is uh, certainly shared with all of these wonderful people uh any mistakes of course are entirely mine and should not be attributed to my collaborators uh okay so uh what do i really mean by uh, state estimation um so the question is uh as posed as follows uh, suppose we consider uh, a dynamical system whose state variable is y so y is a vector and at each time t uh, we have some position some uh, vector in rn and this uh, vector is evolving according to some differential equation so whenever i uh, mean uh, state i really imply something that satisfies a differential equation and the basic setup is we know that the state evolves according to some equation but all we have access to is a particular measurement of the state so here i represent uh, the measurement which is a single real number so it's a scalar the state is a vector but we are measuring a scalar 
And the essential question is, if you're only given the time series of a measurement and you know the differential equation, can you determine what uh, the state itself is? So clearly, if you are only given one real number, but you want to reconstruct n real numbers, uh, that is not a well-posed problem. Uh, the real uh, sort of insight is the fact that the vector y satisfies a differential equation. In particular, we will use typically the fact that the components of y are correlated, are connected to one another. Their dynamics are related. And it's essentially this fact that will help us answer these type of questions in the affirmative. Uh, so another sort of way to uh, pose uh, the same question is I could simply ask, you know, what are the best choices for the vector B such that I can do this reconstruction process, such that I uh, get the full state uh, vector? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the main high story is essentially, it, it depends on the kind of measurements we take and the kind of systems we work with. Uh, so this is actually a remarkably common problem. Uh, it's often the case that what we are actually interested in, we don't measure. Uh, we can uh, only indirectly measure uh, a system. And so this is sort of the natural question you have. Uh, if what you can measure is not what you care about, how do you actually retrieve uh, the, the original variables? Um, if you work in experimental science, you are of course familiar with this. Uh, this is uh, what a lot of experimental science involves. Any kind of instrumentation uh, fundamentally involves a coupling between a signal of interest and a measurement that one can do. Uh, many times, you know, us theoreticians, myself included, tend to focus on what is called the forward problem. That is given an initial condition, how does the system evolve? Um, but if you have to compare with data and measurements, um, you know, it's often the case that you are interested in how do measurements correspond to uh, solutions to differential equations. Here I've also given you a list of potential applications of these kind of problems. Uh, I've personally worked on things like ocean depth measurements from satellite images, uh, some these kind of uh, ocean depth reconstruction problems. Um, another inverse problem is somebody has measured the pressure at the bottom of the ocean and they want to know how high the wave is, what's the height of the water wave. Uh, so this is a pressure to wave height map. This is another example of an inverse problem. Um, oil, oil and gas exploration, uh, is essentially an inverse problem where we are trying to reconstruct the density of a medium based on measurements of uh, wave amplitudes passing through a medium. Uh, so it's another typical example of one of these problems where you have measured something other than what you really care about. Ideally, we would like to measure the density of a medium, but typically what we can measure is uh, amplitudes of sound waves passing through some medium. Uh, another sort of uh, interesting example uh, that I've recently been more interested in is uh, if you have a Bose-Einstein condensate and you have um, uh, you know, uh, measurements of the density, maybe you want to recover the phase, uh, so phase reconstruction. And phase reconstruction in many contexts, it need not be a Bose-Einstein condensate, Many times what one can actually measure are amplitudes, not phases. But if there is an evolution equation that couples phases and amplitudes, maybe this is a problem that is amenable to the techniques that I will discuss. Uh, a number of problems arising in biology that involve sensing of the, an environment, sensing of a population of uh, uh, certain uh, you know, chemical species den uh, or some such thing. These are, can also be understood loosely as um, the kind of problems that uh, I would like to discuss today. Once again, we have measurements of uh, a system and we want to understand how the system itself uh, evolves. So of course, I'm not the first person to do this. Certainly, 
if in the context of atmospheric science, which is where I learned most of these ideas, uh, th these, uh, you know, these kind of uh, tools have been prevalent. It usually goes under the name of something called data assimilation. Uh, typically, one wants to incorporate measurements or observations of the atmosphere into a theoretical model for the simulation of the atmosphere. A number of different approaches are available. Uh, nudging, filtering, uh, 4D bar. Uh, 4D bar is essentially some sort of variational approach. You try to minimize the error subject to some constraints, constraints being the dynamical system. Um, today, I will mostly be focusing on something called nudging, uh, mostly because I feel it is a remarkably simple idea that should be used, I feel, more often in a wide variety of applications. Because it's so easy to use, it, it can uh, sort of give you a first approximation very quickly. And as we will see in many cases, quite do quite well. Uh, there are uh, pitfalls of, of nudging that I will mention later on in the talk, uh, some drawback. But uh, I feel it is theoretically and practically a remarkably simple tool. And I hope to communicate uh, to you in this talk that it's an easy enough thing to do uh, and uh, should be explored uh, by people uh, who are interested in these kinds of problems. It's a well-established theory for nudging in the context of uh, PDEs. Uh, I've listed some uh, uh, references. Uh, the key figure uh, who's inspired a lot of my own work has been mostly Edris Titi and his collaborators who've worked on a number of these kind of uh, nudging-based uh, models. Um, there is some uh, difference between uh, some technicalities uh, that are slightly different between how I approach the problem and how uh, uh, TT approaches the problem. But loosely speaking, we are uh, approaching, uh, there's a lot of commonality. And these are uh, a lot of interesting nudging models that, uh, nudging uh, models that have been implemented for a whole host of hydrodynamic equations by TT and collaborators. Uh, usually he is focused on dissipative dynamics, as I will show today uh, in some examples. Many of these tools carry over at least numerically to the non-dissipative case. And in, sometimes we can, in some cases, we can even prove some nice theorems for the non-dissipative case as well. Um, so if you want some more uh, sort of modern, uh, more recent uh, references, and especially if you're interested in seeing how these uh, tools are implemented in practical problems, I would recommend this very nice uh, recent paper uh, by uh, Agastya uh, and uh, his co-authors uh, in Physics of Fluids, which really is a very uh, good introduction to the ideas of nudging as applied to a PDE problem, uh, where basically they are trying to reconstruct the full uh, Rayleigh-Bernard flow, assuming that only measurements of temperature have been made in the fluid domain. So essentially, the idea is you have a Rayleigh-Bernard flow which couples temperature and fluid velocities uh, together in a system of nonlinear PDEs, uh, I guess the Pusadesk equations in this case. And we have measurements of time series of temperature at various locations in the fluid flow. And the question is, if this is what you are given, how do you reconstruct the consistent velocity field? And they uh, show some very nice uh, simulation results, uh, sort of implementing this idea, testing out uh, how robust the method is. I highly recommend uh, this paper. Um, on the more theoretical side, uh, uh, sort of a more modern advancement is this notion of back and forth nudging, um, which uh, was developed by uh, one of my uh, collaborators. Uh, his student uh, have a more recent study with a little more theoretical uh, analysis of some uh, quasi-geostrophic equations. Uh, so this is a, a, you know, one of these problems which is not dissipative, but nonetheless, these kind of tools work. And so if you're interested in a little more theoretical understanding of these things, I, I would also recommend this paper by uh, Amurawi and, and 
co-authors. Um, so let me get to the meat of uh, sort of the, the, the ideas. The, the, the basic uh, idea is as follows. Let's, let's take a very simple example. Here is a, a two-dimensional differential equation. And as we can see, the variables x1 and x2 are coupled. Uh, many of you might recognize this as simply the uh, simple harmonic motion, right? It's just the uh, linear oscillator uh, for x1 and x2. And let's ask a sort of preliminary question. Suppose the system evolved according to these differential equations and we were given the time series x1 of t, and we wanted to know what is the consistent x2 of t. So you're given one variable as a function of time, and you want to know what the other variable is. Alternatively, you could have asked the converse, the sort of vice versa question, right? So given x2, can you find x1? And without any sort of detailed analysis or technical uh, sort of detail, we can just look at the differential equation and answer both questions in the affirmative. Yes, we can uh, find x2 of t given x1 of t. And that's because that's literally what the differential equation says. The differential equation says the time derivative of x1 equals x2. So if I am given x1 and I can differentiate x1 with respect to time, then I automatically have x2. And if you read the second line of the differential equation, you can see that given x2, you can find x1. Right? So essentially, this differential equation allows us to answer these two questions in the affirmative. This is the simplest possible case of our state estimation. Given one variable, we can estimate the other variable precisely because of this off-diagonal coupling. It's this off-diagonal coupling that allows us to answer this question. Let's modify the system slightly. So now I've got a different matrix and it's still a linear system, but as you can see, X2 evolves independently of X1. X2 evolves according to a differential equation that only depends on x2. So we can sort of see that the evolution of x2 is not affected by x1, but the evolution of x1 is affected by x2. So there's a one-way coupling in this problem. The previous problem had a two-way coupling. Both variables were coupled to each other. In this case, only one variable is coupled to another. And if we ask the same question, Given x1, can we find x2? And given x2, can we find x1? And now what we see is that the first question, given x1, can we find x2? The answer is still yes. We can read the first line and say that if I have x1, I have the time derivative of x1. And then I can essentially solve the first equation for x2 as x1 dot minus lambda x1. That will equal x2. So we can easily solve for x2 given x1. On the other hand, the other way doesn't really work. That's because if we know x2 and only x, uh, x2 is what we know, then we can never actually solve for x1 exactly. Once again, if we consider the first equation where x1 dot equals lambda x1 plus x2, Given x2, this is an ODE for x1 of, uh, of t, but we will never find the homogeneous solution from that unless we know the initial condition. If we knew the initial condition, then the whole game is very easy. We have no problems whatsoever. So the, the, the point here is, if we knew the initial condition, state estimation is easy. Typically, we don't know the initial condition. We only know one of the variables. And in that case, getting the homogeneous state uh, is, in this particular problem, impossible. However, whether this is important or not depends on the sign of lambda. As if lambda were negative, 
then as t tends to infinity, the homogeneous state is irrelevant. And uh, x1 dynamics are essentially driven by x2. On the other hand, if lambda were zero, then uh, the influence of the homogeneous solution sort of never goes away. So this is a, uh, the simplest example of where we have a one-way coupling and only one of the variables is a good variable to measure. The other one, not so good. Now let's come to what I consider is in some sense, the worst possible case. Suppose the matrix is diagonal. In this case, X1 and X2 both evolve independently. As a result, measuring one variable tells you nothing about the other variable. They are decoupled. So what we would naturally think is the easiest, best differential equation for a diagonal matrix happens to be, from the perspective of state estimation, the worst problem. So the main message, if you want to take one message away from my talk, is very simple. Coupling is good, the nature of the coupling matters. The more the coupling, the better, but the nature of the coupling is also important. Uncoupled differential equations are the hardest problem to do state estimation because you essentially have to measure the whole state. Otherwise, you cannot see, uh, because all the variables are uncoupled, if you don't measure the whole state, you will just be missing some information. Coupling is good. So let's try to upgrade all of these ideas into a general uh, linear equation. So previously I talked about a simple two by two problem. I now want to uh, present to you that many of the ideas have a systematic uh, generalization to the n by n case. So let's imagine that our dynamical system is a linear dynamical system given by some matrix A characterized by some matrix A. Let's assume we have measurements Z of T based on uh, this uh, vector B. And the claim is that given Z, we can find Y if and only if this particular matrix S is invertible. So I've written S in terms of columns. So the first, uh, sorry, in terms of rows, sorry. So the first row is B transpose, the second row is B transpose A, and so on and so forth. So this is an N by N matrix. And the statement is, if S is invertible, then we can recover the state Y from Z. So Y is a vector, Z is a scalar. Despite that fact, we can in fact find uh, the whole vector Y of T. And why is this true? Well, it essentially follows from the following fact. Since Z is given as B transpose Y, and since Y satisfies this particular differential equation, we can basically write down Z of T in terms of the solution of the differential equation given some initial condition. And what we will show is that essentially, if you are given Z of T and this S matrix is invertible, we can find the initial condition. Remember, as I said, once we find the initial condition, it says we have essentially found the actual trajectory because of uniqueness. So since we are given Z of T, we can differentiate this Z, uh, this, uh, Z function in time, J times, and evaluate at zero. When we do that, we end up with a uh, set of conditions for each J derivative which can be written in matrix form as follows. So since we are given Z of T in principle, we can compute these derivatives and we see that we have an N by N system of equations for the N initial conditions or the N components of the initial condition. By assumption, this matrix is invertible and hence the initial condition is obtainable. By uniqueness of ODEs, if we know the initial condition, then we can identify the solution. So the argument that this S matrix should be invertible is sufficient is, the, is, is what I have just detailed. 
However, this is rarely how we go about solving these problems. And so in practice, we do something slightly different. We construct a new ODE, which looks like the original model plus a feedback term, an error feedback term. So since Z is my measurement, we think of Y tilde as my current guess for the state. Then B transpose Y tilde is my hypothetical current estimate of my measurement. So then B transpose Y tilde minus Z is like my measurement error. And it's this measurement error that we use to drive our equation. And phi represents some feedback gain. You can also think about this equation for Y tilde as essentially changing the dynamics with some forcing. Why is this a useful idea to consider? It's because if we look at the equation for the error, which is to say, look at the equation satisfied by y tilde minus y, then we see that it solves some particular equation of the following form. Now, the interesting claim is that all eigenvalues of this matrix, A plus V, B transpose, all eigenvalues can be pushed to the left half plane uh, as far as we want if and only if the previous mentioned S matrix is invertible. So why is this a useful idea? Is because if all the eigenvalues of the matrix A plus V, B transpose have negative real part, then the error goes to zero exponentially. And so then that means y tilde converges to y. So this is a very simple idea. Essentially, you just drag your state estimate to something that is consistent with the measurements. And it says, if you do that, you will reconstruct the state. y tilde will converge to y. All we need is a clever way to choose phi based on the fact that S is invertible. So this is usually known as Ackermann's method. I've just sort of written all the useful pieces of information here. And it involves just a change of variables from the error equation to some new variable uh, based on a transform uh, P. P is defined in terms of columns. So the first column is V, the second column is AV, A squared V, so on, where V is the last column of S inverse. I'm not uh, trying to convince you that this is a uh, logical thing to do. What I am trying to do is summarize the following fact that by doing an appropriate explicit calculation, we can basically change the eigenvalues of A plus Phoebe transpose to anything we want. So we can simply change the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of PAP inverse, and hence we can affect uh, the dynamics of the whole problem to essentially what we want. Um, and I think this is uh, one of the sort of nice things, which is A, it is constructive, B, it is in every control theory book that you will ever pick up. So it's usually known by Ackermann's method or pole placement or eigenvalue placement theorem. Um, and there are even software packages that given an A matrix and given a B vector, how to compute these uh, uh, transforms and what the gain should be. So it's a very well-developed technology as far as ordinary diff linear ordinary differential equations are concerned. What's nice to know is actually um, many of these ideas can be upgraded to nonlinear differential equations. So in this case, we have a nonlinear differential equation with similar uh, measurement. And once again, you essentially do the simplest thing. You just add an error term, a feedback error term to your equation and call this your observer model. You just numerically solve the observer model for the given set of uh, uh, Z of T, the given measurements. And the idea is choose phi so that Y tilde will always converge to Y 
independent of whichever initial condition you picked for Y tilde. And I think that's the key point, right? If we knew the initial condition for Y, we wouldn't have to do any of this. Essentially, we have to do state estimation because we don't know the initial condition. What we can show is we can construct a synthetic differential equation whose long time behavior converges to the state consistent with the measurement, no matter which initial condition we picked for this Y tilde model. And what's remarkable is that under suitable hypotheses, one can actually show that the nonlinear problem has a convergence to the true state, even when I use the linear model to design the feedback term. So there is a, a, essentially an assumption of smallness generically, although in some cases one can bypass the smallness uh, requirement as well. Shall, shall I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, in the case of linear OD, linear ODs, you are able to construct the solution, right? Somehow. In the case of linear ODs, I, uh, I basically sh can show okay. that the error equation is the solution at one stage. The error that is y tilde converges to y. That's what that's what, that's what we can do. Okay. Right. And the reason y tilde converges to y is because this matrix has uh, eigenvalues in the left half plane. Okay. So every solution is e to the minus something t. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm asking. But uh, in the case of nonlinear ODs, how do you do that? Huh. So in the case of nonlinear ODEs, it's essentially a ground wall type estimate that well, we assume that F is Lipschitz and we can still design phi such that all the, the such that the error still goes to zero. So there are no eigenvalues, but you can prove a statement about the semi-group. So essentially, you can uh, show like an energy-based argument if you if you want to think about it that way. So y tilde minus y squared goes to zero. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. So it's it's not uh, an obvious statement, but what 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 you can show is uh, uh, you can prove a theorem. Uh, a good reference for some of this stuff is there's a book by. Uh, uh, Koron, uh, C O R O N, uh, nonlinearity and control. Uh, he does, uh, he proves a similar statement for some uh, control problems, and uh, the arguments are, can be adapted for the present case as well. So, so far, all of this has been finite dimensional, ordinary differential equations. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to look at was actually for PDEs. So I've written an abstract version of a PDE where there's a linear operator and some nonlinear operator and some observation operator. Uh, just to sort of make life easy and conc uh, things concrete, let's consider periodic boundary conditions. So periodic boundary conditions in X. Then the linear problem is just an ODE with a parameter K. So, for each wave number, we end up with some finite dimensional system. So we can repeat our understanding from uh, state estimation for ODEs to state estimation for linear PDEs, and just keep in mind that there is a parameter, the wave number floating around. So if you can make uniform in wave number statements for the eigenvalues, then you've actually answered the question for the PDE. So what is a PDE? You can you know, loosely think about a PDE as an ODE with a parameter K, where K is the wave number. So repeat the ODE argument for each K and then show convergence for linear PDEs. So that's uh, sort of what I'm suggesting here. What's interesting is one can actually prove uh, a theorem, once again, based on a ground wall type argument, uh, that even the nonlinear PDE can show convergence under suitable hypotheses. And I've sort of listed what the hypotheses are. 
So here, SFD is the semi-group associated with the linear operator. Um, and uh, the claim is if you can establish some semi-group bound, you can see this exponential decay for the linear solution, and N is locally Lipschitz, uh, then for sufficiently small in a certain technical sense, um, then uh, some, some smallness condition, uh, then you can show that the Q tilde equation, which is the analogous observer model, but for PDEs now, right? So this Q tilde equation has a solution which converges to the Q solution as T tends to infinity. And once again, the design of the feedback is based on the linear equation, but you have to choose parameters uh, in some careful sense. I don't want to get into too many of the details because um, the specific details are uh, related to individual problems. And one, one, one can't talk about problems at this abstract level. You have to talk about a particular problem, which I'll come to later on. But so what is this big lambda? Ah, sorry, uh, I guess I changed notation. That that is the same operate. That's the same thing that's playing the role of V here. So v, uh, this big lambda is something like a gain uh, uh, feedback gain uh, that we have to amplify the error and force onto the equation. So it's effectively an operator because we're talking about PDEs but it's playing the same role as the fee gain we had for UDEs. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, with PDEs is that quite often, you know, your functions are actually not Lipschitz. So all the technical details uh, arise not from the novelty of state estimation, but really from the fact that PDEs have non-Lipschitz right-hand sides, the typically unbounded operators, derivatives exist. Um, so that's, that's, that's a technical detail, but it's not really something that is specific to the state estimation problem. It's really a problem about PDEs in general. Um, so you can also try to answer, you know, what do you mean by a good variable? A good variable is whichever gives you the largest decay estimate. So find your uh, operator B such that you can get a larger delta. That is a good variable. Let me come to some particular applications where people have used these types of ideas. So this is a paper by Didier Oru uh, and his uh, collaborator, Bonabel. They looked at the shallow water equations. Uh, the shallow water equations govern the uh, motion of a uh, two-dimensional velocity field and uh, height field. And they answered the question saying, if you only observe the height of the water layer, can you deduce the velocity field? So the height uh, field is a function of space and time. And if you know the shallow water equations and you know the height field, can you deduce what the velocity field was? And they included a number of additional effects, uh, viscous dissipation, some wind shear, so on. And they showed that you could, both theoretically and numerically, uh, actually reconstruct the velocity field, both with uh, perfect observations, as well as with noisy observations. Um, Here's a picture on the left that I would like to talk a little bit about so that we can all understand these type of problems. Uh, on the y-axis is the L2 norm of the error in three different variables, either the height, the x-component velocity, or the y-component velocity. And the x-axis is time. So what you can see is indeed that the error sort of drops down with Time. Uh, I believe this is a normalized uh, error. So one corresponds to a uh, sort of hundred percent error, and uh, this is a percentage error that we should read. Um, this is for the full nonlinear shallow water equations in the presence of noisy observations with about twenty percent uh, uh, noise. So think of twenty percent as you know, representative of your SNR, signal to noise ratio. Uh, 
Um, and what you can see is that despite having noise in the observations, you do in, uh, get uh, an improvement in your state estimate. Uh, on the right-hand side, we actually see a particular snapshot for the identified and true velocity fields. On the left-hand side is the identified velocity field, and on the right-hand side is the true velocity field. And you definitely see that this method captures some of the large-scale behavior quite well. There is some fine-grained detail which is missing in uh, the uh, recovered velocity field, but that's understandable given that this is recovery in the presence of noise. And so one uh, would only expect uh, large scale features to be sort of captured, small scale features will probably be inundated in the noise. Here's another example that I was involved with. Um, it was in the broader context of a particular inverse problem where we wanted to estimate the bottom topography given the motion of the free surface. Uh, a key step along the process was to find the velocity uh, field uh, given uh, the uh, uh, sort of height of the, of the uh, water level. Um, in this particular model, we made suitable assumptions such that the surface uh, deviation of the, uh, uh, of the water, eta, surface deviation, eta, and the velocity potential at the surface, Q, satisfied a Hamiltonian equation. So this comes from some physics assumptions, which I don't want to get into, but this is an example of a Hamiltonian PDE where you are given one variable, let's say eta, and you want to deduce the other variable, q. And we played essentially the same observer uh, nudging uh, ideas, and we replaced this Hamiltonian equation with a suitable observer model with a feedback term, and showed that we were able to reduce the error of our state estimate. And on the right-hand side, you can see an error plot in this uh, uh, of error plot versus time for the error either in uh, the field eta, the error in Q, or the error in Qx, the x derivative of Q. Uh, what you can see is that the error in Qx and the error in eta go to zero as t tends to infinity, meaning we are able to reconstruct the x derivative of q uh, as t tends to infinity given eta. However, the uh, zero mode of q and hence the error in q itself does not go to zero. Uh, it saturates at some level. Um, part of this is uh, an acknowledgement of the fact that the equations of motion um, have some gauge freedom, if you want to think about it in those terms. The Hamiltonian in this case only depends on the derivative of Q, not on Q directly. And so in some sense, the average, the spatial average of Q is not an observable quantity. Incidentally, because Q represents a velocity potential, physically only the uh, X derivative of Q is the physical quantity. The potential itself uh, has a baseline that one is not able to uh, produce, uh, reproduce during these uh, state estimations. What we really learned from this is that many of our ideas are not restricted necessarily to uh, hydrodynamic models, but also to sort of these Hamiltonian models. And we are now currently generalizing this to different kinds of Hamiltonians, typically in canonical bracket but uh, Hamiltonians coming from Bose-Einstein condensates in Madeleine form, they all fit the same uh, framework uh, given one of the variables you want to reconstruct the other. So I'll move on now to sort of my main example problem, which is the shallow water equations with uh, the Coriolis term. 
And here we have the equation for a two-dimensional velocity field and uh, a height field uh, written in vector form. And sort of one of the questions we asked was, suppose you were given the vorticity field, can you deduce both components of velocity and the height? So we are given one scalar field and we want to find three scalar fields because there are two components to the velocity and one component to the height. Now I want to stress here that the shallow water equations do not have zero divergence in the velocity field. You know, a lot of people such as myself coming from a fluids background work with incompressible fluids. In which case we all feel that if you have the vorticity, you can deduce the velocity field. But that is only true when you know the divergence as well. In this case, we only know the vorticity. We do not know the divergence. Hence, we cannot use the Biot Savart law. We must use the governing equations themselves. So the, one of the earlier people who looked at this problem uh, was these uh, folks, uh, Xiao, Nevon, and Dimei, uh, who did some very nice numerical simulations and showed that you know, in the absence of Coriolis term, this blue term here, the absence of Coriolis, either one of the velocity components or height was sufficient. More interestingly, when you don't have the blue term, neither vorticity nor divergence are sufficient. What we've been able to show is in fact that in the presence of Coriolis, vorticity is sufficient and divergence is not. So this is an interesting result because what it actually says is in some sense, um, because of a physical effect, the presence of the Coriolis term, the variables which are sufficient to deduce the full state are actually different now. So the Coriolis term, the nature of the coupling, as I mentioned earlier on in the talk, the nature of the coupling matters. And the nature of the coupling is different when you have new physical forces. And those physical terms will influence which are useful variables to focus on and which are uh, variables which don't encode the full state. Um, I'd also like to state that this is a purely PDE result. It doesn't actually depend on uh, a particular grid resolution, which incidentally, the paper by Zhao Nibon and Dume in 1992 actually uh, talked about the discretization of the shallow water equation. Whereas the result we present is actually about the PDE itself. So it doesn't depend on how you chose to discretize it. It's a genuine PDE result. Um, so just to sort of summarize, you have a state vector which consists of two components of velocity and one component of height. We have an original model, which is some PDE. We've made an observation, which in this case happens to be, given the velocity field, find the vorticity, right? So we have a single scalar field and we want to deduce three scalar fields. The trick is now to introduce a synthetic state, Q tilde, as well as keep in mind our measurement error, which is my uh, difference in vorticity between the synthetic state and the, and the observation I have at hand. And we construct a new equation with a feedback term, where phi represents this feedback gain that is the design parameter. And the goal is to choose that gain so that no matter what the initial condition for Q tilde, Q tilde always converges to Q of T, right? That's essentially the same logic as the ODE case, but now phrased for this sort of PDE problem. And the goal is choose phi carefully. So there's a theorem that we can prove that we can indeed determine phi subject to conditions, so uh, sobless spaces, whatnot. Um, so subject to suitable conditions, we can determine this feedback gain such that Q tilde equals Q of T plus a exponentially small term in time. So you can see we do indeed get the convergence as T tends to infinity.
What's surprising is that the theorem is proved for a suitable smallness criterion. However, our numerical results actually indicate that this smallness criterion can be violated and we still get convergence. So the numerics seem to be performing much better and in a uh, sort of more robust way than our current theoretical understanding is. So we are able to use larger errors. We're able to cons uh, show that even then we are able to reconstruct the solution. So the story is not complete yet. We have some understanding that we can do these things, but in practice, we seem to be doing much better than what our theory uh, can explain, which just says we don't fully understand how to prove the perfect theorem just yet. We must use more knowledge about the system, the couplings, to improve our theoretical statements. Another interesting thing I'd like to point out is even in the case when observations are made with error, you can get a theorem that says you will converge exponentially not to the true solution, but true solution plus appropriate error terms as one would expect. And as the error terms go to zero, we once again get perfect recovery. And again, numerics uh, generally seems to do better than our theoretical uh, our, our, our theorems can guarantee. Our theorems currently uh, work for, under a suitable smallness criterion. And personally, I, I believe that this is more a flaw in our arguments that we are making in the theorem. They are not uh, as the tightest bounds that we are achieving. We can probably achieve some better bounds by more subtle arguments. Um, so again, there's some work to be done to fully explain why the numerics uh, works uh, much better than our current theorems. Uh, so the theorems are basically saying it is sufficient, but apparently not necessary. So I'll just quickly go through some uh, numerical experiments for this particular case. Uh, here are some details about the numerical uh, schemes we adopted. Uh, in all cases, we essentially run uh, the true model, determine the uh, data uh, of the vorticity, and then use that to run the observer model with the data. So all in all, we have to double the entire system size and run all the equations so that we generate the data as needed. Of course, in a practical application, one would not need to generate the data via the true model. One would get the data from uh, you know, wherever the data source uh, is, some actual measurements. Um, so essentially, numerically, we solve all of uh, these equations. And I will stop. Uh, this yes. gamma term has been introduced now. Uh, gamma term, the last term. It was not there in the previous equations. Where is the gamma? This new? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So this new is uh, essentially a viscosity. You can think of it as uh, some, if beta is uh, two, this is a, like Laplacian uh, viscosity. So we add, uh, for the numerics, one needs to add uh, the, the viscous term. Otherwise, these equations tend to form shocks. Okay. So this is, this is really for the numerics. Um, one, one, one can't actually run these equations without some amount of high wave number damping. Uh, uh, this is quite well known for the shallow water equations. The atmospheric science community uh, typically even works with beta equals four. So they do some hyper viscosity. Okay, so here is uh, an example uh, error uh, plots. So what I'm showing are in the black dashed curve, the uh, design decay rate. This is what we were, uh, how, this is how we chose our feedback to produce this kind of a decay rate in the error. Uh, the blue lines are the two velocity components. The green line is the height field and the red dashed line is the error in the vorticity. And what we basically see is that the error in all three quantities uh, do indeed uh, go to zero as uh, t tends to infinity. This is not a relative error. Uh, I believe this is actually uh, actual error, small amplitude uh, solutions I'm showing you. 
Um, here we chose a particular decay rate of delta equal to one, but if we change the design decay rate, we see that indeed the uh, solution converges faster as one would expect. Indeed, uh, on the left-hand side, we have a delta equal to one, and on the right-hand side, we have a delta equal to 10. Another interesting thing you could probably do is change the observation frequency. So what if your uh, true model is running at some uh, delta t, but you are only collecting the data at 100 delta t. So you are getting information at a uh, sort of a, a rate, which is um, uh, you know, not the true rate. So the system is probably evolving according to some time scale, but you are measuring it at a longer time scale. Clearly, when we are measuring uh, the, uh, the data at a longer time scale, we expect to not capture certain features which are happening at a shorter time scale. And so on the left-hand side, the data was collected at every time step and we see a beautiful decay rate of, of, the, of the error. And on the right-hand side, we see the same decay rate, but the error now saturates at a different value, essentially corresponding to the fact that the data was actually now collected every 50 time steps and then passed to the observer model. So essentially, the main drawback of these nudging-based models is you must measure at the frequency appropriate for the system. If the system is evolving very quickly, then you must also measure very quickly. If the system is evolving very slowly, then you can measure at, uh, at a slow rate. If the system is evolving quickly, but you are measuring at a slow rate, then one doesn't expect uh, uh, sort of the good convergence results. Um, here's a plot saying that uh, suppose the, uh, there are physics missing, so the original equation doesn't have a viscous term, but your tilde equations do have a viscous term. Uh, once again, we see that the error indeed saturates. Uh, so whenever the, uh, there is a mismatch or there is error either due to observational noise or due to missing physics, one doesn't expect uh, convergence. And these are, of course, you know, drawbacks of the system, but nonetheless, it's uh, an, an easy enough system to decide, like when you understand the, the model very well, uh, this is a very competitive method. When we understand the true physics less, this is less competitive. Uh, maybe a quick word about sort of why does this work? Essentially, because this is, uh, if we look at the simplest possible uh, version of the shallow water equations, um, where we only consider the Coriolis term, we see that basically the divergence and the vorticity satisfy uh, simple harmonic motion. They satisfy a linear oscillator equation. And that's precisely why uh, measuring one or the other is useful, although some of the other effects make the divergence less useful than the vorticity. But it's essentially the, the best case scenario that I started this talk with. Um, some details about the uh, analysis, going from linear uh, ODE to linear PDE is not too uh, uh, difficult. The, essentially, the linear analysis carries through fairly straightforward. Uh, we just want to make sure our decay rates are uniform in the wave number. But other than that, the analysis is quite similar. Uh, the nonlinear part is a little more uh, subtle and technical, largely because of well-known issues with the analysis and well-posedness theorems for nonlinear PDs. However, many of the arguments we use are actually uh, arguments that can also be used to prove well-posedness for nonlinear PDs. So we are able to leverage a lot of the literature that is already known to uh, provide our theorems. Uh, so that is one benefit. Um, however, as I said, the uh, subtleties are all sort of uh, present because of uh, you know, well-known problems with uh, nonlinear PDs, uh, you know, products of functions need to be in suitable spaces, uh, 
uh, suitable estimates. Uh, these are all essentially the standard infinite dimensional problems. Uh, nonetheless, we, uh, we, we are able to provide uh, some theorems to guarantee uh, convergence. So coming to my summary slide, if there's a second take home message I would like to, uh, to give is that if you understand finite dimensional control theory, and there are some wonderful books on elect from the you know, electrical engineers on control theory, if you understand finite dimensional control theory, and if you uh, use the well posedness for nonlinear PDEs uh, from the known literature, you've essentially got state estimation. That's it. There's really nothing else going on here. Combining these two tools, we are able to show state estimation. Nudging itself is a really robust and easy to implement idea that I feel more people should be using. And certainly more people are using nowadays, uh, but there are a wide range of applications for which these type of ideas are amenable. And I feel that the sort of field is kind of open uh, for a lot of people to start working on. The main drawback, as I mentioned, is the need for uh, measurements at a sufficiently high frequency. Uh, in certain applications, if, uh, if this is not available, nudging is perhaps not the best option. Uh, quite often, we find that our numerical results perform better than our current theoretical statements that we can make, uh, current theorems we have. And so that means you know, there is uh, work to be done both on the theoretical side and the numerical side to really understand what is going on here. Um, back and forth nudging is a very nice improvement which allows uh, convergence of the state even for finite time measurements. So I haven't got into the details of back and forth nudging, but what, what, so far everything I presented in the talk required t tends to infinity. With back and forth nudging, even if the data record is for finite time, one is able to show convergence. And finally, I want to end with uh, the, the main model. Uh, coupling is good, uh, the more the better. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to my talk. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. So now the session is open for questions. Clarifications, doubts. Uh, Dr. Vasan, how does your uh, method uh, work for nonlinear equations exhibiting chaos? like uh, Lorentz equation? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. In fact, just this semester, I have had a student work out the observer problem for Lorentz 63. And indeed, uh, it works uh, well subject to making sure you take measurements at a suitable frequency. Neither the chaotic property nor the presence of noise uh, prevents us from capturing the, the, the state. So we are actually able to do this so long as you measure at a frequent uh, enough time. And this kind of makes sense because if you remember in, in sort of uh, uh, the Lorenz attractor, you jump from leaf to leaf. You, can, you, you oscillate in one uh, region and then you jump and oscillate into the other region. Uh, if you take measurements uh, sufficiently fast, you essentially track the trajectory as it's going from back and forth. Um, so the, the, the main drawback of the method is still the same thing. Make sure you uh, take the measurements at a sufficiently fast rate. If you don't take the measurements at a sufficiently fast rate, then the trajectories start deviating. And you, you see any difference a difference in the periodic regime and the chaotic regime in uh, your analysis? Not, not really. Not, uh, not really. We, the, what we uh, o, o only see is that you must measure fast enough. And so it is a statement really about the ODEs. The numerical solution of the ODEs you have to do uh, at, at the appropriate delta T. 
and including if you don't measure sufficiently fast, then the trajectories will, will separate. So this is, of course, of relevance to the atmospheric science community as well, where if they measure uh, chaotic systems at the wrong frequency, then the information is not sufficient for this pr procedure. Some other uh, more sophisticated procedure should be used. Okay, thank you. Are there more questions? So we are not getting any questions. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So since there are uh, no more questions, I would like to conclude the session by thanking Dr. Vishal Vasan for giving a very wonderful talk, for accepting our invitation and giving a very wonderful talk in this forum. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I will write to you the other details. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you.